everybody, I've got a crazy idea. I am going to try to make a product for a startup live on video from scratch. I'm a little nervous about this uh, because even though I'm used to doing design, I've done this for a long time, I've worked with clients, I've run design teams, I've taught design. The actual act of making a thing is like, um, it's very personal and their creativity just uh, naturally involves a lot of mistakes and a lot of downtime and a lot of uh, trying to figure things out. And uh, for most designers, I think it's often a process, at least the craft part can be a process that is very personal and sometimes solitary. Um, and so, um, you know, I'm, I love talking about my process and sharing things that I like to do with people, but actually making the thing live on video um, is, um, is, it's very intimate. Uh, for the same reason that it's a little scary, I think this is uh, kind of an important thing to do. Um, people are always talking about how to make startups. They're always talking about uh, design tips and tricks, and they usually talk about all the mistakes they made after they made them and realized what the mistake was and can say, oh, everything's fine now. We've figured it out. And I think there's always stuff that you're learning as you go through processes. And design is always a little messy, and um, I think that's... A, specifically dangerous for um, young designers and people who aren't like used to being part of the you know in and out you know code process uh, software development process in general because it gives them the impression that um, it's not messy and then when they do the work and it's messy and a little you know takes a little longer than they thought it might for example uh, they can just easily get discouraged or people don't understand um, you know, how quickly a sort of a messy process can result in a really good result. Um, and, you know, I think people just give, you know, it's important to sort of share this. And so I'm so impressed by people, by uh, people like Peter Levels, who's done live coding sessions, other people have done live coding sessions. Um, I think they're a pretty good approximation of what the process actually is like. Um, and so for that reason, I just want to put some idea together and do it live and and share some of the sort of the rabbit holes and mistakes and some of the processes that I actually do when I'm working on a project. Um, big caveat here. Uh, I do design work professionally. Uh, and so I'm often working with startups who have much more than just a random idea in their head. Usually I work with people who have some degree of funding, a small team, and they're dealing with, you know, maybe working on improving a product that they've already put together, reducing complexity, um, you know, helping prioritize the, the roadmap, doing uh, future concept work, improving the design consistency. And so this isn't really representative of what I think a lot of startups need uh, from design early on. It's more representative of that first founder moment when you have an idea and you want to make something and put it into the world and just see where it goes. Um, back to the, the idea of sort of having a raw feed of, of design process and seeing all the, you know, the nuts and bolts and all the little things that happen. I'm going to keep this video, um, these videos pretty unedited. There are going to be a lot of uh, pauses and ums and me staring into space uh, or just looking down like this or sitting like this for a while, most likely because um, that's just what it's like. And I don't want to make this a quick video that you can just stream through right away necessarily because um, I want to give you a pretty realistic impression of, of what's going on. I'm going to try to talk out loud as I go and explain what I'm thinking and what I'm doing. Um, you know, if you have any questions about what's going on, uh, you know, um, feel free to ask them. Uh, I'd like to hear from you and get feedback on this. Uh, and you know, I'll, I'll try not to blur anything out, uh, but I will occasionally blur out, you know, uh, confidential API keys and things like that. Um, other than that, I don't really know what's going to happen. I don't really know where this is going to go or what I'm going to make of this thing uh, or, you know, even how far I'm going to get. Like, uh, you know, through this process, I might realize that this thing isn't really, really viable. Um, I mean, this whole process is sort of like people talk a lot about MVPs, minimum viable products. Uh, I really like the idea that an MVP is really more of a process because uh, to get the V part, the viable part, you have to actually test it with the market and understand that people really like and use this thing. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure we'll get that far here. I think this is really just about building a minimum product. Um, it's about 
saying, all right, I have an idea. What do I need to do to get this design, you know, enough user uh, perspective taking and, you know, um, marketing and engineering and business sense into the early part of this product to build something that we can go test and use to learn more about uh, our hypothesis about what our potential user um, group might be and what their needs are. Um, and it's just an excuse to make something fun and cool because, I don't know, I think making websites and stuff is pretty fun. Maybe that's just me. Um, so um, I've tried to take this completely from scratch, right? Like this is supposed to be um, something that I haven't really started yet, but I have done a couple of things for this idea I have that I'll tell you about in a minute. Uh, first is I did some sketches when I had the idea before I knew I was going to be doing a video of this. And so I have some papers here I've collected that I'll show you in a minute of um, sketches and stuff I did um, when I first kind of came across this thought. Uh, I also have a domain name and I have some voice recordings and some voice journals of this idea that I've done that I just generally do whenever I have an idea. I'll pull out my phone and do a voice memo recording or something. Um, uh, other than that, we're starting completely from scratch. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about this idea. Um, as I mentioned, I'm a design consultant. I work with clients a lot. And um, uh, I've also been lucky to be a part of uh, design workshops and things from other design agencies um, and other designers and design processes. And there's sort of like a format to a well-run workshop that will often happen. Um, you know, sometimes there's these big brainstorms. Sometimes there's, you know, all kinds of methodologies that designers use with ethnography and, and uh a lot of stuff happens, but there's this, a specific thing that I've noticed often in design workshops and other kinds of meetings too in offices, which is that somebody will have a meeting, they'll give a, a small group of people a prompt, uh, and they'll hand out a bunch of post-its, like color-coded for each person. And then everybody will write a bunch of responses to that post-it prompt, and then they'll all put them on the board. The facilitator will try to like group them on a whiteboard like by relatedness. They'll talk about these post-its. Um, often there'll be like a voting session where you put little stickers on the post-its to say like, this is the one that's um, most important to me of all the things we brought up. Um, and then generally there's like a, some agreement, some picture taken of the whiteboard and as a, a way to say, okay, we're going to use this for our design process. And this can be um, a really effective way to build, you know, product UX stuff like customer journey maps. It's also really useful for branding. I've run branding projects where we did this um, to try to identify differentiators, brand attributes, motivations behind brand, practical aspects of brand. Um, I, you know, one of the first times I saw this, I was uh, working with somebody uh, at a company, and she ran a uh, retrospective with the Sprint team using the same method, right? And it was super helpful. I think there's something to this process of having a bunch of people in a meeting to have a live discussion. Like, we're going to figure this out and talk it out. It's not something we can just gather your input like from a, a survey. But it's more than just a free-for-all discussion. This format lets the, the um, facilitator ask specific questions, right? Like, it's these are there's prompts that are prepared in advance. So it can't go too off the rails. The post-it notes encourage people to come up with a lot of answers. So it's not just the first thing that comes into your head. Like there's, it, it helps you dig deeper a little bit and find all the different ideas so that whoever is taking this result afterwards can like have just like a, a, like a, a deep toolbox of all the different things that they wanted to learn out of this. So if it's a sprint retrospective, we want to hear everything that went right well and everything that went wrong. Or if it's a brand, all your ideas for differentiators, etc. cetera. Um, it also lets people... Um, who don't necessarily have a voice otherwise in the company, or might, who might not just be comfortable talking in meetings, it gives them, a, it carves out a very clear space for them to give their feedback. Um, so if you're quiet or, you know, for any other reason, you're not comfortable speaking up in a meeting, um, you are given like a little bit of a room for you to give your piece, which is so important. And if you are somebody who just talks and talks and talks and talks and talks, and talks, and talks, and talks then you're restricted to some degree because you have to fit your ideas on postcards and post-its and eventually the facilitator is going to move on to the ideas from the quiet person. So it is a bit of a balancing of power uh, where um, people lower in a hierarchy who might um, not feel as comfortable for any other reason can give their ideas and that I think is really really important uh, especially in design when you're in sort of a brainstorming mode. Um, 
Dot voting is important because it helps us take all of these crazy ideas after we've discussed them and focus us on the things that really matter most. And, and there's a bit of a group consensus that happens there. Um, taking a picture of a whiteboard after this process is really important because it gives you a record of what's happened. Um, and there's a bit of freedom that you have with the whiteboard and these post-its to move things around and, and sort of put together flows or general arcs of ideas, like as, for example, in a customer journey map. Uh, there are some disadvantages to the, this, though. Uh, although I love paper and use paper, and I've got paper right here uh, all the time, um, have, as somebody who's run a bunch of these workshops in a similar style, uh, you got to have a lot of post-its. you got to have them color-coded. you got to have a lot of Sharpies that aren't out of ink. Um, and that can be kind of a pain. I've also spent a lot of time after these workshops uh, thinking, that was amazing. We got everything we need for our process. I can't wait to dive in and do this work. And then having to sit down for an hour um, or more with a bunch of pictures of whiteboards from this really great workshop and then just whiteboard on one side of my screen, a picture of the whiteboard, and then a Google Doc on the other and just trying to like type all the different things that people said into the Google Doc. And it just takes a long time and it's kind of laborious. Um, and it kind of makes me not want to run these meetings often because I know that there's just going to be a lot of like work before and after to get a lot of this feedback from people. And the Google Doc doesn't capture the same um, things that the other um, that the whiteboard has. For example, it's hard to attribute um, who said what on each post-it to the Google Doc. It's also really hard to read people's handwriting. So you often just have big question marks like, I don't know what this post-it was. Hope it wasn't a good idea because I can't read this person's handwriting. Um, and then sharing out the Google Doc is okay, but it doesn't look like the thing that we all made together in the room, so people tend not to read them or go review back to them. And then the pictures of the whiteboards are, you know, the, like I said, the handwriting is so bad that you really can't get a sense of an outcome from the meeting from just a big picture of the whiteboard. Um, these are really useful often with remote teams. Um, uh, or rather, with for, for kickoffs, um, when you're like at the start of a project or the start of an idea, when you're gathering a lot of feedback, sort of the top of the design funnel, I like to call it. But for remote teams, it's very, very, it's it's essentially almost really impossible to run a facilitated meeting like this in this format remotely uh, in the same way. Um, and so I, I used to run a remote design team and we would definitely plan our kickoff meetings around the times when we'd all be in person together, you know, about once a quarter. Uh, but that was, that was pretty tough because um, it meant that we couldn't, you know, have these, you know, really useful meetings whenever we needed to, for example, after every sprint retrospective. Uh, so I, I have this idea that there's some more structure we can add to this process and do a digital version of this that would be um, really help people who are running workshops, who are running specific kinds of live meetings, like brainstorming meetings. Um, and it's certainly something I would use. So I'm kind of scratching my own itch here, which is another reason this isn't really representative of a real project, because I'm building something for myself, which is fun, but it's not really true design in a lot of ways. Um, there are some other tools that you can use for this. Obviously, you can use survey tools, but like running a survey in the middle of a meeting, um, you know, there's a lot of reasons I think that that's not great. Um, there's um, uh, live whiteboard tools that sometimes people will do uh, and use as a replacement for whiteboards or in addition to whiteboards. Uh, but they're so unstructured, it's it's just kind of like taking a virtual version of this physical thing, where in reality, the, the, the act of this post-it note process is kind of a highly structured process. And that's kind of the point. You don't want people just throwing up anything on the whiteboard at any point, any time. Um, so I don't think virtual whiteboards are a great solution to this. There's also like Kanban boards that you could maybe use for, for a project like this. Um, but, you know, they I, I don't think they really... Uh, are, they're, they're structured in sort of this linear flow, which might be useful, but I think there's just too many limitations to using Trello, for example, for something like this. It doesn't really make sense. Um, I mean, the big disadvantage to a lot of these pieces is that they're not built for live feedback um, uh, in you know a meeting. Like I, I have this idea that this tool might be useful to support people who are running these live facilitations, not as a replacement for a live discussion, but as an enhancement to it. Um, 
because I think that there are just some things you got to get in a room with a lot of people and talk things out. And, and the value of having people bounce ideas off each other at the beginning of a project is so valuable, not just to get the ideas, but to just demonstrate to people that their feedback is welcome and useful. Um, you know, as a team, it's like a really, really important thing to do. Um, and so uh, I want to have some live aspect and there are like some live survey tools, uh, but they're, you know, they're just not very good. They're like built from large student classrooms. Um, you know, they're not something I would want to bring into an office. And they're also like, you know, pick A, B, C, or D or something. It, it, they're not built for live collaborative uh, facilitated brainstorming workshop sessions. Like that's the group we're going after. That's the use case that I specifically want to focus in on. You know, I, I think it's a mistake to generally just say like, oh, what if we could just move information around arbitrarily and do this and have a tool that's like the layer for anything that would work like this. And you know, good good ideas are often very focused on a specific mark with a specific use case, and, and that's what I'm focusing on here, at least for now, until I test it and find out that I'm wrong. Um, there could be some issues with this. I mean, people love paper for these workshops for good reason. It's very flexible, and so if you want to deviate from the, the prompt, you can. Um, uh, I, I have a hypothesis that the added structure will make these so much easier to run and so repeatable that you can actually get the benefit of workshops without having this trained facilitator that um, having not having paper isn't so bad and that the benefits will outweigh the potential of wanting to write on a post-it, the benefits I already described. Um, I, maybe a bigger issue is just the idea of having people on their computers in live brainstorm meetings like that. I think that could be a big problem uh, perceptually for people because I, I think people generally think that if their screen is on that people aren't participating and I I think they might kind of be right, you know. I, I really think it's important that people are focused and paying attention to these meetings. And if they're in their email, um, then they're not participating. And if you give them a reason to look at their screen to add, you know, to use this digital tool to participate in a live brainstorm session, then there's some fear that that might not uh, be conducive to, like, live collaboration as much as a paper prototype is. But I have some ideas about how to address that. Um, and again, I think that's why it's important that I tailor this to like a live experience, specifically for people who are um, running a workshop. And, and I think there's some really interesting ways we can like say, how might we focus people in on um, paying attention to the stuff that's happening around them? Just some design tools, some design cues, a few things that we can do in the, uh, in the application to get people focused up and paying attention to the meeting. I have some ideas for that, but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, so like I said, I have some um, documents here, some recordings. Um, I'm going to basically try to get all my stuff together today. Uh, just get it in like a folder or something. Um, I'm going to try to uh, um, just like get a general sense of like build maybe like just a folder on my desktop of a project or my, my projects folder. Um, then we're going to put together probably we, the Royal we. I'm going to put together wireframes of like just like a, a rough basic first version based off of all the notes and stuff after I've reviewed them. And then, um, you know, we'll probably put it into code, just put together like a rough front end web project um, and see if we can't get something launched that approximates a rough value uh, for this person. Um, uh, you know, I'm not really sure what is gonna happen. Um, we'll also probably put together like a backlog. We, I will probably put together a bit of a backlog of you know all the different things that I want to do and how I want to prioritize them, um, and uh, and so um, yeah you know that's my plan. Uh, I think I'm just going to get started and see how it goes. I'm not really sure uh, what is going to happen or what the process is going to end up being like because I think um, you know so one of my fundamental goals or beliefs about working in startups and working sort of with this lean agile methodology for design is that. Um, you know, sometimes you have to take little small bets on hypotheses. You have to go not build out huge code bases, but you have to build out a little bit of design to see how it feels, see if it's working, show it to somebody. Um, you know, a series of these small little bets, I think, is a better way to navigate complete unknown products. Whereas if you have a really clear set of users and a really clear product, you just need to iterate and build on top of that. You can plan out a little bit more ahead. Um, but frankly, and the reality of of this design process when there's it's so open-ended of what we're going to make here is that things might change it up and um, I'm excited to have people be kind of part of that process and uh, to have you know um, 
a chance to sort of show how that might work um, for everybody else. So, like I said, if you have, if you have any thoughts, I'd love to hear your comments and feedback on this. Um, you know, thank you for 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 giving this a chance, but also, you know, um, go easy on me. And um, I don't know, I'm excited to see how it goes. And like I said, I'm nervous, but uh, I think this could be a product that could be really cool for people and certainly something I would use. Uh, and uh, yeah, here goes nothing. <laughs>